our next presenter is Julie Bird, um, who will be speaking on landscape versus discontinuous district, Florida dugout canoes. Julie Bird is a senior archaeologist at the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research, Division of Historical Resources. She earned an MA in Anthropology at Florida State University in 2011 and a BA in Anthropology at Wake Forest University in 2005. Julie has worked for cultural resource management firms, the Indiana Historical Bureau, Tallahassee Community College, and the National Park Service. Currently, her research focuses on identifying spatial patterns in Florida's dugout canoes to better understand how prehistoric groups use rivers and navig navigable chains of lakes for transportation. Welcome, Julie. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. I'm honored to be here among you guys. I don't have to tell you that Florida is home to the largest concentration of dugout canoes in the world. The national significance of these resources is uncontested due to the, the sheer sample size because dugouts represent the oldest direct evidence of watercraft. In addition to significance, there's agreement that the fragile organic artifacts are worthy of preservation. The Department of State's Conservation Lab has treated numerous canoes over the years, and perhaps more telling, private citizens have repeatedly paid out of pocket for PEG or spent their free time delicately unwrapping and wrapping a slow drying canoe. There's agreement that Florida's canoes are significant on a worldwide scale and worthy of preservation. Why then are only a fraction of the hundreds of dugouts from Florida listed on the National Register of Historic Places? I argue that restrictive National Register categories, mirrored by research questions with limited breadth, have reduced the number of canoe nominations from Florida. I combat both problems by reframing research questions and more practically by first exploring solutions in two NR categories, the discontiguous district and the landscape. More Florida's canoes are not recognized connected collectively, it seems, because Florida's canoes are physically scattered and not all individual canoes have the potential to answer research questions. Canoes are recorded as archaeological sites, and therefore people assume the nomination category will be site, even when a district or a landscape might be more appropriate. <clears throat> this hurdle mirrors a problem in canoe research, where analysis and documentation focuses on single canoes within constricted areas or specific time periods. Listed in 2001, the Pithlachoco Canoe Site, otherwise known as Noonan's Lake, was nominated as a site with National Register boundaries much smaller than the archaeological site boundaries. The Pithlachoco Canoe Site is the world's densest concentration of canoes in a single lake. The site does not adequately represent the full distribution of Florida's dugouts, which spans 6,000 years of maritime navigation in lakes, rivers, creeks, and the ocean. One underlying problem is that most canoe sites are just in fact a single artifact, the canoe. Canoe recording, much like other boat recording, has been highly focused on methodology and data collection from the vessel itself. Methods include detailed sketches, thin sections of wood, radiocarbon dates, and a concerted effort to stabilize the artifact. Because recording methods often lack peripheral vision, even site-level interpretations of canoes focus on the boat. As single artifacts and as objects recognized as archaeological sites, Florida could individually nominate many of our 423 canoes. An individual canoe may establish the earliest direct evidence of watercraft in the Western Hemisphere. Or one unfinished canoe may illuminate canoe manufacture methods. An archaic period boat with a thwart or projecting bow might single-handedly overturn the notion some researchers used to hold about the unilinear nature of canoe typology. This information is important, and site-level research and individual nominations are sometimes appropriate. But to recognize only individual significance of Florida's canoes would be to miss an opportunity to use the largest sample size of log boats in the world. I argue that collectively, Florida's 423 dugout canoes hold exponentially more information potential. To recognize the significance of all of Florida's canoes, there are two options, the discontiguous district and the landscape. I'll briefly consider each with respect to the Florida data set. Quote, for scattered archaeological properties, a discontiguous district is appropriate when the deposits are related to each other through cultural affiliation, period of use, or site type. Covering 41 of Florida's 67 counties, dugout canoes are dispersed and spatially discrete. 
The space between canoes does not diminish the significance of resources comprising the district. As a discontiguous district, Florida's canoes are related to each other through site type rather than cultural affiliation or period of use. As defined, a district must, quote, possess a significant concentration, language, or continuity of sites, end quote. And as the densest concentration of canoes in the world, the canoe district would exist statewide. Recogni recognition as a district would imply that all of Florida's canoes represent a unified entity, even though they are dispersed across a large geographic area. As NPS defines it, a cultural landscape is a geographic area, including both natural and cultural resources. It's been influenced by or reflects human activity. Its definition is broad enough to encompass areas of canoe use and about anything else, but it stresses physical features and ignores the cognitive aspects of other landscape de definitions. More specific to prehistoric boats and navigation routes, a maritime cultural landscape is, quote, the whole network of sailing routes, which for canoes would be the rivering transportation network of interconnected lakes and waterways. Unlike a discontiguous district, a maritime cultural landscape <clears throat> includes old as well as new routes, meaning the now out-of-use transportation routes can be considered. Canoes have become isolated on the modern landscape, as some waterways are no longer navigable due to natural water fluctuations and man-made alterations. Last, the ports and harbors along the coast, or the villages near canoe concentrations, fall within the landscape. <clears throat> Superficially, a discontiguous district seems to be a more appropriate fit for Florida's canoes. The National Register definition for landscape currently focuses on physical elements, not, co excuse me, not cognitive constructs implied by physical elements. Most of Florida's canoe sites lack the classic association, associative features of a port. Almost no canoe sites have associated docks or physical evidence of interface between the water and the land. Many canoe sites probably lie adjacent to villages or campsites, but most adjacent uplands are unsurveyed, so no sites have yet been identified. Whether through district nomination or landscape nomination, canoes fall under Criterion D, have yielded or may be likely to yield information important in history or prehistory. What is the information that Florida's canoes might collectively yield? And should the nature of the information influence the category of recognition? Dominant canoes is a discontiguous district held together by site type and separated in space is to imply that we are analyzing canoes site by site. But what if it is the spatial relationships themselves that yield the important information? Recent research suggests that the information potential of Florida's dugout canoes lies not in the discrete objects, but rather in the association of canoes with navigable water bodies. And despite the lack of associated villages and ports, if this association and context are the important information in prehistory and history, it follows that one might use a maritime cultural landscape to recognize the context rather than a discontiguous district to recognize the site type. For the past three years, my agency has digitized the dugout canoe files, transforming a physical filing cabinet into a Microsoft Access database and GIS. Digitization enables the ability to filter by one of over 50 variables, such as time period, or bow shape, or wood type. It was my assumption that by isolating these variables, we may begin to understand them better, and perhaps realize the potential of previously collected metrics, thin sections of wood, radiocarbon dates, and in some cases, associated artifacts and sites. But previous syntheses of Florida's dugouts have already manually isolated var variables. For example, Newsom and Purdy's 1990 morphological typology. In other synthesis and reevaluation 10 years later, Wheeler et al. overturned the tele teleological concepts within this typology by focusing on archaic period canoes from a single lake. <clears throat> Wheeler and his colleagues isolated archaic period canoes from the rest of the sample and made inferences about technological changes over time. Somewhat ironically, despite the arduous journey of separating all the canoe data into 74 fields, my recent research on canoe distribution suggests that looking at the entire data set rather than picking out one or two canoe features will capitalize on the information potential of dugouts. Therefore, it's not the database and GIS's power to isolate variables that's provided the most insight, but its ability to compile all the data in one digital location, zoom out, and infer broad patterns by asking big anthropological questions. I found that the most important anthropological information potential of Florida's dugouts lies not in the measurements and wood samples from the boats themselves, but in deliberate consideration of overall canoe distribution in space and time. Analyzed together with consideration of the spatial distribution across Florida in the temporal span of 6,000 years, canoes have the potential to answer research questions bigger than site-specific research. Excuse me. 
Big questions I'm ready to ask are now that we have established that canoe morphology does not indicate a chronological typology, what do different canoe shapes indicate? Are canoe shapes functionally different or are shapes indicative of stylistic changes? If stylistic, can we begin to make inferences about canoe use within social groups or geographic culture areas? Geographically, how do Florida's prehistoric populations map onto landscapes of rivers and lakes as demonstrated in dugout canoes? And do prehistoric populations in historic period groups use navigable rivers in the same way? Or can we learn that from dugouts? Archaeologists aren't ready to answer all these questions through dugout canoes, but I'm ready to answer one two-part question. Is the spatial distribution of Florida's dugout canoes non-random? And if not, does human behavior explain the pattern? First, distribution of canoes in space is non-random. The majority of canoes comes from Lakes District in North Florida. Never mind for a moment that one-fourth of the entire canoe sample comes from a single lake. These observations do not require GIS as the University of Florida researchers drew this conclusion 25 years ago. But does human behavior explain the pattern? In 1990, Newsom and Purdy argued that the explanations for the non-random distribution did not lie in patterned human behavior, but instead in one, environments conducive to preservation, and two, researcher bias, which I might add just meant proximity to the University of Florida. <clears throat> in their own words, Newsom and Purdy wrote that the distribution was, quote, more of a function of geology and hydrology than a reflection of the greater cultural importance of the dugout in the North Central Highlands. I disagree and argue that human behavior does explain the non-random spatial distribution. Although researcher bias and preservation play roles in shaping the canoe data set, look to other factors that may play a part, namely geographic distribution favoring edges of basins, or what I call drop-off points and major transportation interchanges. Westerdahl calls these areas transit points, or places where a river-based cultural area meets the outer world. In the interest of time, I won't explain the entire drop spot hypothesis by presenting specific analysis of the data. I won't even describe the ethno-historic evidence we have for canoe caching. Instead, I've chosen to use four s simple examples of canoe concentrations to illustrate my point. These four sites, Pithilchoco, Strickland's Peat Bog, Lake Hollingsworth, and Lake Trafford, represent the four largest canoe sites in Florida. Notice that the first two examples are in the north central lakes region, but importantly, the second two are in central Florida and south Florida. I concur with Newsom and Purdy, the Lakes region is of paramount significance, but I'll demonstrate why I've concluded that, con that the concentrations of canoes in the Lakes District reflects the area's cultural importance as a major interchange, connecting the Atlantic Ocean with the Gulf of Mexico. First, I should orient you on Florida's natural landscape. Florida is a central ridge, which acts like the continental divide. Ri rivers west of the ridge drain to the Gulf of Mexico, while rivers east of the divide drain to the Atlantic, to oversimplify. Everglades used to have a prehistoric extent that looks somewhat like this. <clears throat> Florida has nine major basins, three drainage directions, and 314 plotted prehistoric and historic canoe locations. Each of Florida's four largest canoe concentrations sits at the edge of two drainage basins near the headwaters of a river. First example is Pithlachoco, the densest site with 101 canoes. What's now called Noonan's Lake used to feed into a once wet Payne's Prairie, which was connected to Orange Creek and eventually fed into the St. John's River. St. John's, which flows northward, northward, ultimately flows into the Atlantic Ocean. And just 10 miles to the northeast by overland travel is Lake Santa Fe, which flows into the Santa Fe River, meets the Suwannee River, and ultimately flows into the Gulf of Mexico. Where does the concentration of canoes at Pithlachoco lie? On a relic of the northeastern shore with the closest point to the interchange with transportation to the Gulf of Mexico. And I'm proposing that people dropped canoes here, cached them, intentionally left them, traveled overland, and reached essentially the other coast um, by, intentional, uh, by intentional travel. Second, Strickland's Peat Bog is also near Lake Santa Fe, located approximately 10 miles to the northeast. With 19 canoes, it's the second largest canoe concentration from Florida. Strickland's is situated on the western edge of the St. John's River Basin, connected to the Atlantic through creeks that fed into the St. John's. Less than 10 miles by overland travel is Lake Santa Fe, which feeds into the Santa Fe River and reaches the Gulf through the Suwannee River. Again, this concentration of canoes is situated in a critical natural environment the same, at the same Gulf to Atlantic junction. Yet Strickland's represents a different interchange because although Pithlachoco and Strickland's Peat Bog are only 20 miles by overland travel, by river travel they're 125 miles apart. Strickland's may represent the North St. John's junction, junction while Pithlachoco represents the Middle St. John's station. 
This major interchange is even easier to see when all canoes are mapped. And that's the canoe concentration that Purdy and, and Newsom saw in 1990 before we knew about uh, Noonan's Lake. Note that the canoe locations are not within the St. John's Basin. They're not within the Suwannee Basin, but the concentration lies at the interface between the two. Third largest canoe site is Lake Collingsworth with 14 canoes, located at the very northern extent of the Peace River watershed. Lake Collingsworth is connected to Lake Hancock, which flows into the Peace River and eventually reaches the Gulf of Mexico. Less than five miles by overland travel is the Alafia River, which connects to the Gulf. Also less than five miles <clears throat> from Lake Collingsworth is Blackwater Creek, which flows to the Gulf via the Hillsborough River. Lastly, in South Florida is Lake Trafford, a site with 10 canoes. Lake Trafford is located at the westernmost extent of the historic Everglades and at the headwaters of the Caloosahatchee, Beach, Caloosahatchee Basin. This historic extent of the Everglades was, uh, <clears throat> is from geo-referenced Army Corps pre-drainage maps. Everglades reach the Gulf, they reach the Keys and the Atlantic. Lake Trafford lies at the headwaters of Corkscrew Swamp, which flows through the Imperial to the Gulf of Mexico. <clears throat> to summarize, the distribution is non-random, and it can be explained by human behavior. The natural landscape influenced human use, and the cultural landscape is a controlling of the natural environment. Location of Florida's most dense canoe sites at the beginnings and ends of navigable waterways indicates important landscapes used as transportation interchanges. These interchanges create linkages between riverine routes and overland routes, representing a physical interface between the water and the land. Drawing on cultural geography, I identify interchanges as critical transit points in a greater cross-space and transportation network. From this perspective, the natural landscape, or the orientation and location of rivers within what is now Florida, <clears throat> influenced human interaction and use of this landscape. The cultural landscapes that emerged and persisted over time have the potential to help archaeologists and historians recreate specific ancient mental maps. Thus, the mental imprinting and mapping of functional attributes of the environment, or a cognitive landscape, is writ large in a canoe distribution that shows specific spatial connections. These, spatial, or these spaces became places on the mental map existing only because the location was embedded with cultural meaning. Non-random distribution in space is repeated and mirrored over time. In an effort to make accurate and specific statements about canoe use, researchers have tended to separate the data set by time period, such as Kendara's 1983 conclusions about Mississippian canoes or Wheeler et al.'s 2003 archaic period canoes. Formerly, archaeologists viewed outlying dates as a problem. We probably need to recondition ourselves. At least in the case of canoes, we view such dates not as problematic, but as evidence for continuity of use. Largest canoe sites are all multi-component. Radiocarbon dates from Lake Trafford range from 1420 BP to 250 BP. Canoes from Strickland's Peat Bog dated between 1000 BP and 320 BP, and Pithlachoco canoes range from 4210 BP to 460 BP. Multi-component canoe sites are important because they indicate a tradition of usage and further evidence that mental maps exist and persist. Canoe sites with long time spans are evidence of, quote, well-used havens and routes which implies that the cognitive landscape was so real and so important that the central places on the mental map remained relevant generation after generation. Place names like Pithlachoco, meaning place of many long boats, demonstrate the importance and persistence of places over time. 70% of the boats at Pithlachoco are archaic, yet the place name comes from the Miccosukee language as recorded at contact. The long tradition of use demonstrates that generation after generation learned that Pithlachoco, Trafford, Strickland's, and Hollingsworth were places important enough to incorporate into the cognitive landscape. Summarized, canoes are significant and worthy of preservation, but are typically studied site by site or canoe by canoe. Some of Florida's canoes hold information at an individual scale, but at a large scale, Florida's canoes hold collectively answers to bigger research questions, such as, does human behavior explain the non-random distribution of canoes? The densest canoe concentrations in the world could be viewed as either discontiguous resources in a district or as elements of a landscape, more specifically a maritime cultural landscape, incor incorporating the cognitive aspects. Preservationists are left with a choice between the two categories. I regard the, regard the source of canoe significance as influential in making this decision. In other words, the scale of significance relates to the category of nomination. In response to big research questions, I identified four maritime cultural landscapes in Florida's canoes. These landscapes recognize the significance of the space as a place on the natural landscape and long traditions of usage in addition to the log boat. Underlying importance of identifying ancient landscapes in concentrations of canoes is a better understanding of the cultural geography of Florida's ancient groups and a realization that log boats were not static objects scattered across Florida. They were made, used, and deposited by humans. 
Viewing Florida's canoes collectively as a maritime cultural landscape is the first step in recognizing that the log boats hold value beyond the information stored in the carved wood alone, and that the contexts, in addition to the objects, are worthy of preservation. Thank you.